Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Springtime in the Rockies. <laughs> Snow today, 70 tomorrow. <laughs> How many of you were here last Sunday? Okay, those of you that weren't here last Sunday need to get on YouTube and watch the video. Our, our worship team and our readers did an incredible job. I was incredibly blessed. I was shocked when I stood up and turned around to see there was not even, I think there were two empty seats in the entire house and we had people standing up over in the corner. I'm sitting on the floor. I'm sitting on the floor. Um, I, I want to say thank you very much to Steve and Angie and Christy for working so hard to put that together, for uh, Benjamin and Mackenzie for just kind of being on call to come in whenever we needed, and for the readers who, um, most of whom didn't know they were going to be reading till the Sunday before. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> and Kevin. And Richard knew before, but I didn't get them the script till the week before, so uh, they did an incredible job. So thank you guys very much. Now, I had originally intended that our intern was going to be sharing a message with us today. But I started thinking, that's kind of a cheap shot. Because the day, the Sunday after Easter, the crowds diminish significantly. <laughs> Not in girth, just in population. Okay? And I thought, eh, that's not really fair to Josh to, to not have a full house for him so that he can sweat it like I do. <laughs> so, so Josh is actually going to be sharing a message with us next week, unless he has a dentist appointment in Ireland or something. <laughs> he, he has warned me that might be the case. <laughs> So today, we've wrapped up our series on the fruit of the Spirit. I've got another series that will be starting here pretty soon. Uh, I don't know which one it's going to be. I've got three that God has kind of laid on my heart. Um, but today doesn't have anything to do with any of the three. Well, kind of. <coughs> with all three. But not really. <laughs> um, I did something with this week's message that I normally don't do. I wrote it out. Almost word for word. As a matter of fact, the gist of the message is exactly word for word. And so I'm, I'm probably going to be reading a lot instead of just expounding as I normally do. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign that, God, your hand moves and none can stay it. When you have declared your will and your purpose, none can turn it back. Father, we thank you that you have said you will never leave us and never forsake us. That, Father, even on the battleground, you're there with us. You're the one that has carried us. Father, even in what we see as defeats, you are there, teaching us, leading us. I ask, Father, your blessing on your word today. Father, that it would come forth with truth and clarity. That, Father, it would not fall idly to the ground. I ask, Father, if there would be anything of me in this, that, Father, it would be open. Let me speak only what you would have me say, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can pray for me. Daddy. Because one of the pills that I take, one of the side effects is dry mouth. And I usually get it twice a week. Once on Wednesday and once on Sunday. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. When you've got to preach a message and you're stung, your tongue is stuck to your mouth, it's, it's tough. Okay, everybody needs a piece of paper. If you have a bulletin, you can write on the back of the bulletin. If you don't have a piece of paper, wave at me. I'll grab some paper off of the credenza. So if you need a piece of paper, put your hand up. Matthew does. Um, Josh, could you get Matthew's bulletin off of the back there? Anyone else? Here. 
Mike needs one. So if you guys could hand bulletin down to those that need one. Ted needs one. Okay, I guess you got it. Pat. So everybody needs a piece of paper. We're going to take a minute. I would like for you to write on the paper the things that are most important to you in this life. Do not put God. We're going to, we're going to address that later. That's kind of a given. All right? But I want you to put everything outside of God that is important to you in this life. Be honest. When you've got that written out, being honest, one of the things I had to put on mine was food. <laughs> Hunting. I don't, I don't think it's fair to say don't put God. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna address that. We're gonna address that. We're, we're gonna get there. Freedom. That's a good one. Okay, I still see some of you writing, so we'll give you just a little bit more. you need to put your organizer on there. <laughs> I had to put my iPad on mine. So. <laughs> He's got the most incredible organizer I've ever seen. It comes with sticky notes of all different shapes and sizes. It's incredible. Okay, now go ahead and set that list to the side. We're going to Talk a little bit before we come back to the list. The very first message that I gave at Jesus Community Church was titled, Passions, Pursuit, and Priorities. And we're going to kind of come back to that message. Because I've, I've been looking around, I've been watching the news, I've been reading the news, I've been talking with you guys that get other sources of news, and there's some things that I want to address. First, the nature of our culture has changed dramatically from that message to this. We have seen the promotion of a twisted version of marriage, 
where its very definition is being re rewritten to accommodate a blatantly sinful lifestyle. Our society has not left it to us to have our beliefs held in respect, but has required that our beliefs be changed to conform to the new moral standard that society itself has written. Our leadership at the highest levels holds biblical Christianity to be lacking in love and holding to an outdated standard. The irony of this does not escape me for generations, even centuries, and now, even millennia, the world has always held that in order to be civilized, a society must allow those behaviors that in the early stages of their cultural development were forbidden. Civilization, it seems, grows more civilized as it frees people to engage in behavior that not only opposes biblical morality, but is blatantly offensive to God the very God that gives them life. While those who stand for godly behavior are marginalized as unloving, callous, and narrow-minded bigots. Even the church itself is fractured with many dissenting voices and pointing fingers. Many in the church are baffled as to why there's an issue at all. Isn't God a God of love? Doesn't he love all people? Standing openly and, and oftentimes violently opposed to this are those who say, yes, but God is also just. <clears throat> and somewhere in between, we realize that God is not only the God of perfect love, he is also the God of perfect justice and absolutely holy. How did we come to this place where the freedom to voice our opinion and belief is now curtailed as a hate crime when we, above all people, should demonstrate love? Not this garbage that Dr. Spock would have us preach, where any behavior is accepted because we love you. <clears throat> this garbage that allows the innocent to play with their sin unknowing of the cost, but the love that dares to speak of the holiness of God, that loves us and gave his very life that we might too be holy. This kind of love dares to say, no, I will not stand idly by while you rush headlong into the very gates of hell. We view a world that denounces atrocities like the beheading of 21 men for their views of God and eternity, but refuses to con condemn those who commit these atrocities, where people can use the excuse of their beliefs to kidnap, rape, and murder those whose beliefs are different. The world looks on in horror, but does little to stop. Where do we fit in? Where does our faith require that we stand? What are our priorities at this point in our lives? Are we more concerned about our comforts, our rights as Americans, than we are the directives, commands, and commission of our Lord? Do we dare stand up and say, no, this is wrong? <laughs> Patrick Henry, in addressing the Congress of Virginia at their second Congress, said these words. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with such a formidable adversary. But when will we be stronger? Will it be next week? Will it be next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and a guard is placed in every house? Shall we gather strength by irresolution and inaction? I tell you, sir, that we are not weak if we make proper use of the means which the God of our nature has placed at our disposal. <clears throat> now, Patrick Henry was addressing 
separation from the mother state of England and establishing a new country. But see, as Christians, this should be our cry. The world looks at us as weak, <coughs> ineffective, inefficient, outdated, outmoded. A people that can't even agree on a single thing amongst themselves, much less with people that aren't, aren't a part of them. You're either those of the Baptists that picket <coughs> soldiers' funerals, or you're of those of the Presbyterian and the Episcopalian that embrace everything. And the world doesn't see that there is a way that is better than both. Because we as a church, as the body of Christ, as the ambassadors of Christ, have settled our faith right here in our chairs. And we don't dare to carry it out into the world. It makes me question my faith, my belief. If I really emphatically believe that there is a God who is righteous and holy, and that we as man have sinned and grievously separated ourselves from Him, so that the only alternative for us is eternity in hell and torment. And if I believe that that God, because he is not only just, is also loving, has made a way that I can avoid that eternity and be forgiven and be reconciled to him, that I might have joy everlasting, why am I not telling others about it? Why am I eager to discuss politics, but not salvation? Why am I willing to discuss the vagaries of weather, or fill out my bracket for the NCAA finals? Why do I waste my time on those things that don't satisfy. Looking and knowing that there are people that are close to me who at this very moment have no hope in their future. I can sit on a throne of righteous indignation at the decisions that the president and the government of this country have made and say, how dare they? <coughs> but I won't talk to my neighbor about the condition of his soul. How can I stand at the gas station and talk over the pump about the ridiculousness of the prices going up on gas and how much we've got in the Bakken oil fields and how much better it would be for us as a country and the economics of producing our own gas versus buying it from overseas and not offer him hope. What am I passionate about? Do I care more about my freedom to have a gun than the condition of your soul? Do I care more about my freedom of speech and the things I'm allowed to say versus the things I'm not than about what I really am and am not saying? Have I set myself in a place where the things that I read every day and the things that I profess to you that I believe, the rest of the world doesn't know? Because I'm only secure in expounding those things in the confines of these walls or in the fellowship of this group. 
Is this really what God has sent his son to die for? See, Peter tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a peculiar people. Am I more concerned about being an American than I am about being a Christian? What are my priorities? You can determine your priorities. You can determine your passion by what you devote your time to pursuing. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's easy. God never said it would be easy. As a matter of fact, God makes it very clear that it's going to be hard. Jesus told us that, hey, if they hate me, they're going to despise you. They're going to persecute you. They will say malicious things about you. They will turn you over to be tortured and put to death. Our country has changed more in the last six years than I ever thought I would see in my life. I remember sitting in the brothers meeting discussing the future under Obama, Barack, Barack Obama as president. And I, I did not believe that we would see the changes that we've seen. I do not speak to dishonor our president. God put him there. God has ordained him to that position at this time to fulfill God's purposes. Every leader is appointed of God to fulfill his purposes. And when we waste our time railing about the stupidity of his decisions because they don't agree with ours, who are we really calling into judgment? God. God, you're so foolish to let these things happen. You, you think God didn't know? This is a part of God's plan. See, the way Scripture reads, the way prophecy foretells, we don't get to float along in life till Christ returns. We are incredibly blessed to be born in this country where we have freedom even today to do this. We can gather together, we can worship openly. We can call out to our God publicly. We have freedom, such as the majority of the world doesn't even comprehend. And what has that freedom given us? Pastor, you've got to make sure we're done by 12 o'clock, because, man, my game is on at noon. You'd forgive me if I slip out a little early. It's given us a generation of fat, lazy, incompetent Christians. Our Christianity is obese. It has gorged itself on the pleasures of serving a gracious God who has placed us in a very profitable society and culture. 
and has refused to discipline itself to be what he has called us to be. We're comfortable. Hey, hey, don't rock the boat. Please, fluff my pillow. This is what I need, a more comfortable pillow. I posted an article on our Facebook page. If you have opportunity, I would request that you please read it. This is a gentleman who has taken exception with the latest statistics for Christianity in America. <laughs> latest statistics put Christians at about 70 to 80 percent of the population in the United States. <clears throat> His, <clears throat> excuse me. His premise is very simple. If 80% of this country believes the same thing, why are we in the place we are? <clears throat> so he started looking at what criteria were met to determine whether someone was a Christian or not. A checkbox. So he established some of his own criteria and he started doing his own investigation. You know that 70 to 80 percent? When it comes to Bible-believing evangelical Christians in America, do you know how significantly that drops? 7 to 8 percent. Yeah. Seven to eight percent. See, I, man, I can go just about anywhere and run into Christians. Yeah, I did that. You can call yourself anything. That doesn't change who or what you are. Today, I'm a Big Mac. <laughs> Laugh all you want. I'm a Big Mac. I'm two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles and onions, all on a sesame seed bun. Mm -mm. Well, how do you know I'm not a Big Mac? Prove it. I don't look like a Big Mac. They all got to look the same. Can I tell you, the one on the picture at the menu doesn't look like the one they gave me in the box. <laughs> How do you know I'm not a Big Mac? <clears throat> okay, I'm a super Big Mac. <laughs> That is, Wait, that you don't taste like one. I don't yeah, he would know. <laughs> I have none of the attributes of a Big Mac. You can determine that I'm not a Big Mac by what I am and what a Big Mac is. And see, the same holds true for Christianity. You walk around proclaiming to be a Christian where it's safe. Or maybe where it might even be questionably safe. But when the rubber meets the road, how sure are you about that faith? How firm are you on that foundation? You see, there's a lot of people walking around today professing to be Christians. 80% of America? 80% of America? The way is narrow and the gate small, and few are those who find it. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not? 
And they're going to have attributes that most of us don't have. Did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not drive out demons in your name? And he's going to say to them, Oh, okay, you're in. No. He's going to tell them, Depart from me. See, they recognize him. He does not recognize them. I never knew you. I have no idea who you are. We're so arrogant. We're very, very self-centered. Not only are we egocentric, but we're also egotistical. See, see, my grandchildren are egocentric, and we raise them that way. Everything revolves around them. They're hungry, we feed them. They're sleepy, we put them to bed. <coughs> and then they get to a certain point, we go, uh-uh, not like that anymore. Man, when I'm hungry, I know where the kitchen is. When I'm sleepy, I still got stuff I got to do. Christy does not put me to bed. She goes, did you finish? <laughs> oh yeah, I gotta do that. See, that's egocentric. And that's the way we live our lives. Thinking that everything revolves around us. But egotistical is believing that you're good enough to merit that. Well, yeah, everything revolves around me. Why wouldn't it? What's not to like? And as Christians in this country, we've taken everything that God has given us, and we've taken everything that our country gives us, and we've mashed them up into this horrible goulash, and we can't tell the two apart. Quite honestly, if we were to lose our freedom of speech, it would not affect most Christians' lives in this country. Because they're not professing Christ. They don't say, hey, I am opposed to abortion. I am opposed to homosexuality. I am opposed to adultery. I am opposed to lying, to cheating, to stealing, to fat. Because you understand, gluttony is a sin, right? <clears throat> oh, but gluttony is not so bad. Really, God despises it. <laughs> God despises it. But that's okay. So, so we rail against losing privileges that we don't take advantage of. While all the while, we have people over in countries like Nepal or Iran who just getting together like this is a death sentence. Who owning a Bible deserves torture. To share with somebody else what they believe, proselytizing, <laughs> witnessing, sharing is a death sentence. They don't have these rights, but look what they're doing. There is a, 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 a revival underway in Iran that you don't hear about on the news. Because people have lived under this regime for years and years and years, and they're realizing there's no hope. And you know where the most of those people are being saved out of? Not, not just out of the moderates. There are radical Muslims being saved. Because they've gone the full measure and they've embraced everything that Allah has to offer and it left them empty and cold. And they're looking for something to give meaning to everything that they're doing. But we've got freedom.
Boy, we have freedom. Do you really believe that what you believe is really real? We are a people that is more concerned with our comforts than we are with our commission. We have decorated our tents. We have padded them and made them comfortable. Never really contemplating that all the things we're putting into our tent were taken away from our reward in heaven. I'm not talking about your house. Okay? I'm not talking about your, the, the physical location that you live in. I'm talking about your life. See, becoming a Christian is easy because God's done all the work. Mm -hmm. Living Christ-like is hard because it requires that you die to yourself. It requires that you take up your cross and follow him. That you set aside all those things that you think are going to be good for you and you embrace everything that he has for you. <clears throat> It requires denying yourself. I, I, I deny myself. I only went out to eat four times this week. I deny myself. Man, I read three and a half verses today. Man, that's a verse and a half further than I normally do. Pitching in for Jesus. I remembered to bless my food. It wasn't really what I wanted, but you know, she cooked it and you gotta kinda eat it and you know, well thank you God for this food and McDonald's that I will pursue afterwards. Listen people, he's given us a task, okay? He's given us a commission. He has tasked us with taking his light into a dark, dying world with taking a message of hope. See, gospel means good news. You have good news to share with them. Not pointing your finger down at them. Not standing in superiority over them because we understand the full measure of what he's forgiven us for. How can we stand in judgment on them? They don't even have Him. That's all they know. They don't have God's Spirit showing them that what they're doing is wrong. The church makes a stand. We're so bold. <coughs> all them homosexuals go on to hell. Yeah, so are the gossips. So are the liars. So are the ones that cheat and steal. So is anyone that doesn't know Jesus Christ personally and is known by him personally. Let's pick and choose our sins, shall we? How's your cup? Is it dirty inside or out? Have we become like the Pharisees? That we're superior in our faith and our religion, and yet we have no relationship to sustain it? And so we prop each other up? Hey, we're good. We're good. We're good. Why? How do we know we're good? Well, because I told you you're good. Now you got to tell me I'm good, so I know I'm good. We pat each other on the back, and home we go. <coughs> a 
Okay. So now I've beat you up pretty good. Now for the balm of Gilead. I don't have to give you. Only God does. I have a message of hope that I can give you. That this God that you serve loves you. And he wants the absolute very best for you. Better than you can even imagine. And he's willing to make <coughs> life difficult so you can have those things. He's willing to let you hurt so you can have those things. He's willing to let you lose things so you can have those things. He did not say it would be easy, but he said he would be right there with you. He said he will be your refuge, your high tower, your fortress, the rock on which you stand. He has sent his spirit to give you everything, absolutely everything you need for this life. He has given you his word, his personal word. From him, via the mouth of the prophets, to you, to me. Things look bleak, get in the Word. Things rough, get in the Word. Things great, really get in the Word. Really get in the Word. Proverbs chapter 30 tells us two things that I would ask of you, God. To have neither too much nor too little. Don't give me too much that I might grow arrogant and say, look at what I have done and forsake God. Nor give me too little that I might be tempted to steal and thus bring dishonor on you. See, Scripture also tells us, what, what do you have but what God gave you? And if God gave it to you, why do you act as though he didn't? I mean, everything that you have in your life, take a look at your list. Pull them out and look at your list. Every single thing on that list, God has given you. Now here's, here's the crux, here's the trouble. Are there any of those things on that list that you would not give up for God? iPad, psh, gone. I can use a pen and paper to write my stuff. Food, uh, okay, God. Grandchildren, children, wife, siblings, parents. <coughs> okay. God, if they are an idol to me, take them. Deuteronomy chapter 13 talks about families and how the Israelites were supposed to treat families who would try and sway them away from God. <coughs> Jesus even goes so far as to say, that if you love them more than me, you're not worthy of me. Uh, that, that, that doesn't mean that we don't love them. Because see, if you really will put God first, at the apex of everything in your life, you put God at the top. He is going to do a work in you such that you will love them as you never thought possible. Because you're going to love them correctly. You're going to love them in the right order. <clears throat> See, see, when I love Christy more than I love God, I'm loving her in my own strength. And my own strength is, is frail. And, and she does things that upset me. 
and, and she does things that irritate me. And in my own strength, if, if our love, my love for her is based on my own strength, I'm not going to appear very loving to her oftentimes. But if I put God first and I'm pursuing him wholeheartedly, recklessly abandoned to him, how do you suppose I treat her? Wow, God sustains me. She does those things that irritates me, and they don't irritate me. She does those things that anger me, and man, when I am pursuing God, and my focus is right, and my heart is right, they don't anger me. I can't explain it. You question yourself honestly and truly. Is there anything on your list that you would not give up if God asked? Because if there is, you have an idol in your life that has taken the place of God. You have told God, I will love you this much, but I'm not going to love you all the way. This is more important to me. This is what, where my heart really is. I guarantee you, if you will lay them down before God, He'll have you pick them back up in the right order, and it will be better than you've ever imagined. Because things will be possible with God that are absolutely impossible with you. I'm not telling you you got to get rid of your list. I'm telling you that God's more important than your list. I'm telling you that if you passionately seek Him, He's going to add value to those things on your list because He gave them to you. He put them in your life. Christy tells me that I encourage with a two-by-four. I'm an exhorter, not an encourager. I, 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 I try. I'm going to try to encourage you today. Because up to now, everything's been exhortation, and I understand that. And I don't want you to feel like I'm looking down on you because, see, God had to take me through this before I could give it to you. So I'm not, I'm not in any way on a high horse. I'm not in any way arrogant in this because I had my own list that I had to make. And I had my own confrontation with where am I at and am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And I lay this before you not so you will feel bad but so that your life, your walk, your relationship with God can be everything that he desires it to be. That you will set aside anything that would encumber you, anything that would slow you down, anything that would burden you, anything that would cause even the slightest degree of separation with God. Let him carry those burdens. He's much more suited to it than you are. Embrace what he has for you. <clears throat> Whatever you do, in word or deed, whatever you do, do it as unto him. Okay? Man, if you're burning your grilled cheese, burn it to him. You got that neighbor you need to talk to? <clears throat> Open your mouth. Let God give you the words to speak. He has promised you that he would. Let his Holy Spirit well up inside of you and speak out through you. They don't like what you have to say? Fantastic. Because that means you're following in the footsteps of the Master. Because they didn't like what he had to say either. They mock you even better. They hurl abuse on you and heap insults on you. <clears throat> Fantastic! Because that means you look more and more like him. That we would be considered worthy to suffer for his namesake. 
Look, I'm not anti-American. I am pro-Christian. Okay? And the nation that I belong to first has Christ at its head, now and always. And if that means that my loyalty to this nation is called into question, then let it be. Then let it be. I still think this is a great country. I still think we have freedoms here that the majority of the world doesn't have. I think even with everything that is going wrong now, should God choose to do so, he could right the course of this nation make it great again. But honestly, part of me hopes he doesn't. Because that just means we're that much closer to him coming back. And ultimately, above all things, I want that. I want him coming back. I, I, I don't care if my candidate gets elected president if it means that it's putting off his coming back for another four years. I'd rather the other candidate won and he come back now. Okay? Establish your priorities. Pursue them with passion. Set your hearts and your minds on things above and not things of this earth. Don't look like the world. Don't conform to what they tell you you have to be. Let God transform you by the renewing of your mind. That's the only way you get to know what he wants. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Let him change you and see what he would make of you. You know, I, I am absolutely convinced that in this body, in this group right here, we have mighty, mighty men and women of God that have been sitting on the benches and have yet to get into the fight. But when they get into the fight, the enemy better watch out. The enemy better watch out. Because, see, he's lulled us into a false sense of security and a place of complacency. But when God wakes us up and shakes us loose... We've got warriors. We have got people that will take the fight to the gates of the enemy and tear those gates down because the weapons of our warfare are mighty for the tearing down of strongholds. We have people in this body who will take light into dark places. We have people that will fight this battle on their knees and on their faces before God so that those that are actually face to face with the enemy will be strengthened. And I believe that we have more people in this church that are going to be going out into the world. I believe that we're going to have more pins on that map. I believe that this church, in order to fulfill the plans and the purposes that God has for it, has got to send people out. <coughs> We've got to get outside of these walls, folks. We've got to take this message, this hope, this love, this passion, outside of these walls to a dark world. Some of you, it may be in your home. You've got to let your light shine. Some of you, it may be in your workplace. <laughs> let your light shine. Some of you, it may be something that you don't even, you're not even aware of yet, that God has placed in your heart a call, a need, a drive to fulfill his purposes, and you will go and shine your light. that the gospel would reach the uttermost parts of the world. Oh, Pastor Glenn, they've already heard it. 
tell them again. Tell them again, tell them again, tell them again, tell them again. When they tell you to shut up, get on your knees and pray that God would open an opportunity for you to tell them again. Not arguing. You're a sinner. God hates sin. You poor, poor person. God hates sin. You should come to church. I mean, you should come to church. You should sit right next to me. Me. Because I, I've been there. I've done that. I'm all over it. Yeah. See you in church Sunday. You need a ride? Jesus spoke the truth in love. In love. If your motivation is to go out there and, and to prove the superiority of your beliefs or, or your stand or your life, you're going with wrong motives. You've got to go out there and love them. Love them. That's the kind of love that Jesus showed. Oh, he, he, didn't, he didn't beat around the bush. He didn't prevaricate. He went out and he told them the truth. And he loved them. And sometimes that truth was hard. Man, you look at the woes that he laid on the Pharisees. Wow. Boy, he must have had a hate for them. No. He had a deep, abiding, sincere, heart-wrenching love for them. And he knew they were not receiving it. And he had to speak harshly to them. Why? So they might turn. Motivated. Driven by his love. That's where we need to be. Father... Father, forgive us. Father, help us see. Help us to have your heart. Father, for the people around us. Help us to see them as you see them. God, to love them as you love them. To love them enough to tell them that they're walking. They're running headlong to an eternity separated from you. Father, help us to love you enough to do what you've asked us to do. Help us, Father, to wake up. To strengthen that which remains. To shake off the slumber, the complacency, all that distracts, all that divides. Help us, Father, to be a people that would honor you. Let our lives glorify you. Give us boldness, Father, as we've never had before. To be obedient and open our mouths and let you speak through us. Father, help us to be tools fit for your hand. I ask your blessing on this fellowship, Father. I ask, Lord God, that your blessings would be abundantly poured out on this family. Lord God, whatever form you would choose, 
let your blessings be poured out. Lord God, that we would be encouraged, strengthened. <coughs> Bless you, Father. In Jesus' name.